Uh, so my name is Larry Correa. I, uh, I'm a novelist. I'm best known for the Monster Hunter International series. Uh, is my big one. I also do the Son of the Black Sword epic fantasy. I do uh, the Hard Magic um, uh, alternate history superheroes series. I do the Tom Stranger uh, comedy series. Uh, 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 that's the... Uh, on Audible primarily, Adam Baldwin's the narrator on that. I do a bunch of other stuff. I got a, my co-host yelled at me yesterday, I kept forgetting to tell people this, but I, I have a writing podcast called Writer Dojo. Uh, new episodes every Wednesday, and it's just me and another author named Steve Diamond just talking about writing stuff. So if that, if this is helpful for you guys today, check that out. Uh, we're in our first season, but it's been a lot of fun. And uh, okay, so. We'll get going. Um, I, I'm primarily known as an action guy. I do a lot of action writing. Um, all Everything I write is kind of an action thing. I got a rep for that. And so I've been drafted to do action panels a lot over the years. Um, so what I'll do is I'm just going to babble fire hose, you know, rapid fire <laughs> for the first part. And then I'll take questions at the end. And um, on action stuff... I kind of went up with this background because uh, before I was a writer, I was a firearms instructor for a lot of years. Yesterday, I did a panel on guns. Uh, I did a lesson on how to write guns in fiction because that was my career for a lot of years. And part of that is I did a lot of training stuff. Uh, as an instructor, I had to take a lot of classes myself, and I got to have a lot of cool experiences. And a lot of that stuff was things that was able to translate into my writing career. My first book, I started out indie. I was self-published. Uh, I wrote Monster Hunter International, and I marketed it primarily to an audience of gun nuts on internet gun forums. This is back before the ebook revolution. You guys are lucky now. It's awesome. All right, so you got to you got to remember your heritage here. Before the ebook revolution, I was selling twenty-five dollar print-on-demand paperbacks. Can you imagine? Hey, I'm a new guy. Buy my $25 cheap ass pod. <laughs> so you guys have it great now. It's a lot different. But that said, you got a lot more competition now too. Um, so that's how I started out. Uh, and because I was writing for an audience of gun nuts, uh, I, I really gun nutted up my first books. And um, that's kind of how I got my rep. And I've kind of run with it ever since. Give you an idea about my background, or my, my audience now. I was the number one best-selling author in Baghdad. <laughs> Uh, and also Bagram. So that was just give you an idea what my, my fan base is like. Uh, I write for audiences, that kind of audience that loves action, adventure, explosions, face punching. So we're going to get going here. All right. So I think we're, yeah, yeah that's, that's perfect. We'll start the lesson right on time. See, I told you guys we'd get through the boring stuff. All right. So, okay. Nuts and bolts. <laughs> Nuts and bolts of writing action. Okay, writing action is really challenging because there's a certain thing about pacing. When the human brain is scanning down a page and we're reading a book, um, we have a certain speed, we have a certain flow. Now, when you get into writing action bits, you have this tendency to want to describe every action that the people are taking. This is a trap because what happens is if you talk about every single thing that these characters are doing in their action scene, on the page, that's going to slowly expand. Because if you describe every punch thrown in a fight, and that's taking a line, all of a sudden the fastest paced part of your scene, or fastest paced part of your book, is now the longest. And what happens to the human brain when we run into that wall of text? They start to skim. Okay, if you guys ever get to the point where your readers are bored or confused and start to skim, that's the kiss of death. Because the next thing happens is they get kicked out of the book, they lose immersion. Losing immersion is like the ultimate sin as a writer, okay? So don't, the goal here is when you guys are writing action scenes is you want to keep the, uh, the reader immersed in the scene as they go, okay? So that's key. Everything we're doing when we're writing action scenes is to pull them along. So you got to watch out for this. Um, and you'll see this a lot in like classic novels. Okay, so we just, you know, we all watched Dune the movie just recently, right? Um, who's read Dune the novel recently? Okay, how long is the knife fight scene? It's like 40,000 pages, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, because that's, that's what I'm getting. So it depends on the type of story you're writing. If you're writing a highly technical thing uh, where you need to describe every single thrust and cut and parry of the fight scene, then by all means do it because that is what the reader is expecting. That's what they're going into doing that. Um, you know, Louis Lamore, famous classic Western writer, he had whole short stories that were one round of a boxing match. 
okay? But he had the chops and the skills to do that, and plus he was a boxer, all right? So he had, and that's what they were, people were reading that story for. If you were writing cozy mysteries or you're writing, uh, you know, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, and you get into the 18-page descriptive fight scene, all right, you're going to lose a lot of readers. So write for your audience. I write Monster Hunter, so I write blood and guts, monsters, explosions. My readers are expecting technical proficiency, and they're expecting a certain level of intensity. So when you're writing your action sequences, you need to dial up that intensity knob too. So if you're going back to My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, and all of a sudden Sparkle Butt steps on an IED, and, and okay, so write your action sequences appropriate for your audience. Because um, I've actually seen that where, where um, the audience is expecting one level of action, one level of violence, one level of intensity, and you change that on them too suddenly, it's kind of like you pulled a bait and switch. And so they're going to get kicked out of the story. Same thing, too. If you're writing something that seems like a hyper gritty, realistic thing, and you all of a sudden have like some silly, nonsensical comedy kind of action, it's going to kick them out. So it's all, about, it's all about vibe. It's all about flavor. It's all about intensity. You guys control that knob. Now, you can control the speed with which this happens. You can control the intensity if up and down. But just remember, you have a certain window based upon your genre okay, that you're writing in. No, just keep that in mind. I, I've actually had this happen where, like, and you see it sometimes in young adult or kid stuff, uh, where it's aimed at a younger, more sensitive audience, and all of a sudden it's like, good hell, I wouldn't put this in Monster Hunter. And it's like, I'm, like I said, I'm writing this for guys you know, riding tanks around, okay? No. When I say how much is too much, on the action sequences, avoid what I call checklisting, Okay? And when I say avoid, keep in mind, guys, there's no rules. Um, because for any rule, anybody who gives you guys rules of writing, they're full of crap. Because for every rule, there's a really successful author that violates the hell out of it. Okay? So these are suggestions. And if you can work around this, if you've got the skill sets necessary to work around it, you can do anything. Don't worry about the rules. Okay? Rules, they're kind of like training wheels. You know, you need your training wheels on your bike until you really know how to ride, and then you can ditch the training wheels. Uh, and you, you can throw out a lot of you can throw a lot of these rules out the window if you've got the skills to pull it off. Okay, but until you got the skills to pull it off, you know, be careful. Okay, so when I say checklisting, avoid this. Have you guys ever seen a page where it's I did this, I did this, he did that, he did that, I did this, I did this? That's called checklisting. If you can scan down the page and you see I I I I I he 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 he. That is somebody who's going through and they've taken a scene in their head and they're describing every single action in that scene. That's going to get boring real fast. The more complicated the scene, the more boring that's going to get. So a lot of times you guys want to condense this down. So for example, many years ago, I was writing this uh, thriller series with another author. His name was Mike Coopery. It was the Dead Six. Uh, so this is a book called um, Swords of Exodus. And there's this really violent scene where a dude is escaping from a secret prison. Okay, it's like this black site prison. And he's the prisoner they've been experimenting on. And he's just beating the shit out of a bunch of... I'm sorry, I shouldn't swear. <laughs> he's beating the hell... <laughs> wow, this is why I don't write My Little Pony. Um, okay, so he's beating up a bunch of prison guards as he's escaping this prison. And at one point, Mike, Mike is writing this first sequence. And I'm going through and I'm editing it. So you guys know what a baton is, you know, one of those police batons, it's a side handle baton, and you hold it like this, and it goes down your arm. So Mike had this really cool sequence where he comes up and he hits a guy, and he hits him again a certain way, and he's using the baton all cool. But it's like this giant paragraph of him trying to describe, because you've got to describe this weird weapon that most readers aren't familiar with, and how he's holding it, and the nature of it, and so forth. So he wrote this big, long, massive paragraph that really kind of, slowed down the intensity of this cool escape scene, right? And so I edited it, and he put all this work into it, and when I edited it, I was like, I beat him with the baton. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad, but it was like, so, so you got to be real careful. You don't need to explain everything. Don't over-explain. Explain enough that the reader understands and they aren't confused. Because the other side of this is if you don't explain enough, the reader loses context of the action scene, and that's bad. Now, unless you want to convey confusion, if you want to con convey that fog of war, that chaos, and you want to make it where you're not really sure where everybody's standing, that's great if that's what you're going for. <clears throat> but if you're writing a scene where you want them to understand, 
and they don't have the context of what is actually going on, you're going to lose the reader. They're going to get confused. So make sure you give them enough information so they know where all the players are and all the important things, but not so much they get bored and start to skim. Okay? That's the famous Elmore Leonard quote, don't write the bits, they skim. Okay? Or something to that effect. I can't remember exactly how it goes. But, um, okay, so you guys got that. Now, Point of view character. This is huge. When you guys are writing an action scene, it's usually unless you're writing, you know, third person omniscient, which most of you aren't nowadays. Um, you know, you're not writing the Cimmerillion, okay? Um, you have a point of view character. This is going to be factored through their eyeballs. So either third person or first person. And this character is going to be experiencing these events. And he's going to be narrating this so the readers are going to be feeling it through his eyes. Now, on your action sequences, and I talked about this on the gun panel yesterday. It all is going to come down to what that character is like. What is that character? Ask yourself, this character who's narrating the scene, what is their skill, their knowledge, their courage, their commitment? Uh, what is their state of mind? Write the scene according to that. So if you have a scene and you want to hype it up and make it that it's terrifying, write it from the point of view of the inexperienced person who's getting their ass handed to them. Okay? If you want to write the cold, calculating, professional killer, then the perspective is going to be entirely different. Uh, the example uh, I use is, if he, I have a novel called Hard Magic, um, and it's a kind of alternate history. Some of you guys have read it. Pretty good. Just sold the rights to Radar Pictures. Knock on wood. <laughs> oh, I hope, yeah, yeah they're, they're making the wheel of time right now, so I hope that makes a billion dollars so that they have more money to throw at this. <laughs> We'll see what, don't chase Hollywood guys, they're flaky. I had stuff optioned for years and it never gets made. So, um, but, so Hard Magic, I've got two main characters. One character, and he's a World War I veteran. He's a hard-boiled detective archetype. And he's got superpowers uh, in this universe. He is a bad dude. He is tough, he is stoic. He, he's kind of like made, he's like fists of stone. This dude has been there, done that, seen everything. Hardcore dude. They call him Heavy Jake Sullivan, right? So when I write action scenes from Heavy Jake Sullivan's perspective, he's calm. Stuff is exploding all around him. People are dying, and he's just taking care of business. He's beating a dude. He's like, oh, well, this is good. Well, I've got to do this and got to do this. And he's shooting dudes. And this is, to him, just business. And so all his scenes are written in this certain cadence, this certain voice. The second character is a girl named Sally Faye Vieira, who's a teenager. Uh, she's a Dust Bowl oaky orphan refugee. Um, and she is hyperactive and kind of nuts. <laughs> when I write Sally Faye, everything is like super hyperactive, run on sentences, and plus she's inexperienced when the series starts. So the, the difference is if I want to show an action scene from the perspective of this dude who is a you know, hardcore combat veteran who is hard to face, totally different than I write her, and it's just chaos and madness, and she doesn't know what the hell is going on. She's constantly surprised by new developments, but she's got a brain like a ping pong ball. Okay, So when I'm writing her, totally different voice. Okay, so I want you guys to think about that. So when you're writing your action sequences, just think about the voice of the character. When I say skill, courage, commitment, knowledge, I, I talked, I mentioned yesterday in my other panel about the Buffy the Vampire Slayer syndrome. Okay, and, and writers talk about this once in a while. If you guys have seen the Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV show, it was very common for you'd have a teenage, just regular teenage kid would learn about that vampires are real and then 15 minutes later can have a kung fu fight against them. Okay, so in real life, what's going to happen if you take the average 15-year-old and say, go kung fu fight that supernatural being? You're going to get ripped apart, okay? So, write according to what that person would know. If you guys are writing, you know, a fight scene, a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight scene, and the main character is, you know, some, you know, Chuck Liddell UFC fighter, it's going to be like, oh, I got this guy, no, beating the crap out of him, oh, that's a lot of blood. Should I have nachos for dinner? Hmm, I like nachos. You know, okay, totally different. Whereas if you take the regular person who's never been in that kind of situation, it's going to be a lot of flailing and screaming. Okay, So write according to the flavor you're trying to establish. Keep in mind what your point of view character. They, they only know what they know. Uh, on that note, you guys only know what you know. And I see a lot of people get scared to write action because they haven't actually been there and done that. Uh, I, I've run into this a lot. People are like, well, I can't write you know, a fight scene because I don't know about fighting. I can't write a shooting scene because I don't know about shooting. Well, I got news for you guys. None of us have ever sword fought dragon. 
Okay, yet we still can write that. Well, okay, so one guy. All right, to be fair. <laughs> All right, but you guys are see what I'm saying here. You don't have to have actually done this stuff to write it convincingly. Tom Clancy was an insurance salesman, okay, and one of the most successful writers of all time. So, <clears throat> I mean, he wasn't a badass special operator. He wasn't a submarine commander, okay? You just need to fake it till you make it. You need to know enough. You need to do your research. We'll talk about that more. But you need to do your research enough to fake it in a way that people who do understand that stuff believe that you know what you're talking about. Okay, and uh, I have people who a lot of times they'll read my stuff and, and they think that I've actually done some of these things. No, I have not. I've never done anything that interesting. I'm a former accountant, okay? <laughs> but luckily I was an accountant in the gun business, so I got to shoot and blow up a lot of stuff, which was fun, which I learned from. On that note, research, you guys go out and do whatever you can. Have life experiences that will make your action sequences better. I recommend going out and if you're gonna write fight scenes, go take some martial arts classes of some kind that you enjoy. Um, boxing is wonderful. One of the best things I can say is when I read a book, I can, and a, the character gets hit, I can tell you if that writer has ever been punched in the face. Who's been punched in the face? Okay, the rest of you need to go out and get punched in the face. <laughs> All right, just kidding, this is on video, so do not, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't. In a safe and controlled environment, go get punched in the face. When I say this, is because there's a certain visceral thing about that. Those who've got their butts kicked know what it's like to get their butts kicked. So you can write it in a way that's more convincing. Um, there are certain things that you experience when you are in a life or death situation. Uh, if you haven't done that, go look on the internet, look up effects of adrenaline. There are certain effects that adrenaline has on the human body that you can convey in your fiction. There's, and then after the things like the handshakes, but your, your hand will start to, you get the shakes really bad when that leaves your system. But beforehand, you'll have things like where time dilates, um, your vision tunnels, you get really bad dry mouth. Because honestly, for those of you that have been sucker punched, you know that if you are sucker punched before you have an adrenaline rush, it's waterworks because your eyes will immediately start to basically squirt water. It's not that you're a wuss and you're crying, it's that when you get punched in the nose and your nose is broken, your eyes are gonna water. But if you have an adrenaline rush first and you get punched in the face, you tend to have, it's, it's dry, because you're, all that stuff is getting sucked to your core, okay? This is all stuff that you will experience and it makes your fight scenes more visceral, okay? So if you know what it's like to get choked into unconsciousness, you know, go take a jujitsu class. You will get choked into that consciousness and the, the looming blackness comes for you. You'll be able to write that better. Does that make sense? Okay, guns. I talked about how to hold class yesterday on guns. If you're writing books with guns in them, you owe it to yourself to go shoot some guns. Learn how these things feel. Learn how they actually sound, how they smell, what recoil is like. You can always tell a book of a person who's only read about stuff or watched about it on TV versus a person who's actually put in some time and learned what they could. Uh, not action related, but I say the one thing if you guys get wrong, the one group that will scream at you and yell at you and give you bad reviews more than any other, horse people. I said this yesterday. Yeah, and you know, if you ever read a book where they get the horses wrong and a horse is basically a magic motorcycle that runs on hay, horse people are gonna leave you the worst reviews ever. Second to them are gun people. Third are probably knife and sword people, and they're weird. <laughs> now on that, like at one point, I, I have a gun background, so I've met most of my first novels I mean, uh, I, were gunny novels. I mean, I had a lot of shooting, uh, stuff I knew, had a lot of explosions. My best friend's an EOD guy, so I was able to ask him a lot of bomb questions. Shooting and explosions, I was good with. Um, I got in uh, writing Son of the Black Sword, an epic fantasy series. It's done really well. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bestseller, and... Uh, I don't know anything about sword fighting. I don't come from a sword fighting background. I've never done sword fighting. So one of the things I did, um, I, I sought out people who this is their thing. This is what they love. And I specifically had one guy who was from the, the Hank, Wright, or Hank Reinhardt Memorial Fight Team, so Western martial artist guys, sword fighting, and had him walk me through and teach me a bunch of stuff. And then I would write the book after doing my research. He was one of my alpha readers. I would then bounce this off of to check all the fight scenes to make sure that I wasn't doing anything in sword fighting that was stupid or would kick those people out, okay? Once again, this is gonna come back to the level of realism you're writing to, because if you're writing 
pulpy action <clears throat> silliness, then it doesn't need to be perfectly realistic. Okay, you can, you can cut corners on that. I mean, I love The Mummy. You guys have all seen the movie The Mummy, right? Are the fight scenes in The Mummy realistic? No, not at all. No, not even close. But if you write that kind of thing, you know, then, then by all means, write to that level. Now, if you're writing realistic, though, Laura and I talked about this in the gun class, too. So, so, so probably you guys might want to, like, uh, watch the video of it later if you didn't go to that. The human body doesn't have hit points, okay? <laughs> we, have, we have blood pressure, so it's different. So what happens is uh, un if you're writing action scenes where people are going to get hurt, go do some research about what happens to the human body when it gets hurt. It's not at all like the movies. And uh, what will happen is actually if you write, can write these visceral injury scenes, it can be pretty intense. And the audience loves it when you get into like what actually happens to people because it's chances for drama. It's great chances for conflict and drama. I've, I've had, got some great scenes where I've, I've had more drama from the aftermath of the fight scene uh, talking about dealing with like people that are hurt because it's another dramatic scene trying to treat an injured person. Um, and so I've gotten some great opportunities out of that. So go learn what happens to the human bodies when they get shot, stabbed. It's really not like the movies at all unless you're writing for that kind of audience. If you're writing, you know, you guys ever seen the movie Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis? Bruce Willis shoots a dude with a 1911 and literally it picks him up and flings his body 18 feet back through a window he catches fire, you know, <laughs> goes rolling. That is not what happens at all. But if you're writing a, 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 a action scene or an action thing with that level of realism, by all means, go for that. If that's your, how your universe works and run with that. If I wrote that, I'd have a whole bunch of people screaming at me, okay, because what they expect. Um, <clears throat> on research, be really careful because there's a lot of so-called experts on the Internet that will be happy to help you but they don't know what the hell they're talking about and they're actually full of crap and you'll be worse off because you listen to them and put their terrible advice in your book. Okay, so be really careful with that. And, and basically, I, I can't tell you how to spot somebody who's full of crap. What I would say is ask several people and look for kind of like, you know, if one dude is wildly divergent from the masses, you know, or if you don't really know at all, once again, this is the scene you're going to write from the perspective of the person who doesn't know. If you don't know how this thing works, you don't need to describe it nearly as much because that point of view character is not going to be able to describe it that well either. If you're writing the master jujitsu guy and he gets a guy in a certain hold, he's going to tell that narrator is going to tell you exactly what hold he has this dude in. If you got Johnny slap fight, it's, you know, totally different. Okay, so let's see. We talked about. Uh, uh, let me just check my notes real fast here. Sorry, because I, I will babble inanely for hours and I don't want to repeat myself. Okay, checklist, emotional stuff, wordy, not too wordy. All right, <laughs> I like my notes here. If it's boring, fix it. <laughs> okay, I think, I think I hit most of my things here. But I got one other thing I was gonna say. When we talk about action, it's kind of a really large category, writing action. You think about action is a huge thing. Don't fall into the trap of thinking your action scenes are action only. Uh, I'll see this a lot of times with, with less skilled writers. They will, they will kind of like, you're reading their book and you can kind of see what they're thinking. This is a plot scene. This is a background scene. This is a character development scene. Oh, I better have an action scene. Let's have more plot later. Okay, you see what I'm saying? That's actually kind of clumsy. And, you, and honestly, it come, the school of writing comes from people who watch like Hollywood blockbusters, okay, that aren't like the brainiest movies. Honestly, guys, your action sequences are some of the absolute best opportunities for character development. Uh, big reveals, you know, like you have the action sequence and all of a sudden, oh, that guy's the traitor. Whoa. You know, there's all these opportunities in action scenes to do things other than just action. The action scenes are really there to get your readers excited. And the reader is excited, they're engaged, and all of a sudden you drop some cool character development into this scene. Wow. It's going to mean more to the reader because they're engaged. It's once again, it goes back to the old show, show versus tell thing. And don't get me wrong, sometimes telling is great. I mean, David Weber is here and he sold more books than most of us put together, right? And Dave does a lot of tell. Um, but you're in an action scene. What a great time to show somebody's character, somebody's courage. That you want to show that somebody's a hero, you demonstrate they're a hero. You don't just say they're a hero. 
It's like, you know, you got the bullets are flying, and then all of a sudden the dude steps in front of the, the innocent bystander and scoops up the kid and runs away from the explosion, okay? You know, so these are, action scenes are a great opportunity to, to expand everything. So don't think of action as separate. Think of action as an integral part of the book where you're accomplishing big things and doing the heart racing, you know, glue in the reader to the, to the page. On pacing, this is one you gotta watch out for too. There can be too much action. And I, this is coming from, you know, Larry Cree, okay? I'm action paid for my house. That said, think of your book like this. It's, it's gonna come and go in waves. If you have a book that is intense nonstop, you know, so you think this is your intense part, this is your calm part, this is your intense part. If you have a book that's nothing but intensity, nonstop, and it's just intense, 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 well, what has happened is you have now established that intense is the baseline. And the reader's gonna get bored. They're gonna get bored of explosions. Have you guys ever watched like a Michael Bay movie? And it's just like the last 45 minutes is explosion, explosion, explosion. Have you ever gotten to the point where you're bored of explosions? Yeah. And, and there, that's, that's actually how the human brain works because we have now established intense is normal. But you gotta take it up, take it down. Tick it up, tick it down. Have that moment after the action sequence where they deal with the aftermath, the repercussions, okay? Mix it up. Don't be afraid. You, you don't have to be action nonstop. But my friends have a joke about me, like my alpha readers, that if you're reading a Larry Korea novel and you've gone 30 or 40 pages and nothing's exploded, a single bead of sweat rolls down Larry's head, you know? <laughs> like, oh crap, I need to explode something. So mix it up, uh, not all intense, all the time. Uh, when I also say mix it up, another way to look at this too is um, one time I was writing a novel. Uh, it was actually the novel Dead Six, and it was a, a thriller novel, and it was kind of like the uh, international super thief versus gang of mercenaries, okay? And I was looking afterwards at the action sequences in this book, and they were good. They were well written. They were good action sequences, but it was the characters went to a place and got into a gunfight. And then later on, the characters went to a place and got into a gunfight. And then the characters went to a place and got in a gunfight. And then for the finale, the characters went to a place and got into a gunfight. <laughs> so I was looking at this editorially and thinking, no, nah, it's kind of stupid. And it was, it was realistic for, for the setting. However, what I did is I decided I was going to mix this up. And there's different ways you can mix this up so your action is not always the same. In this case, we left the first scene where the characters went to a place and got in a gunfight because that wasn't formulaic yet. The next sequence we had where it turned into an assassination, where the characters got into place way early to take the dude out, only then things went horribly sideways and their escape plan fell apart and it turned into a car chase where they carjacked a car and then had to escape through the, the, the narrow winding streets of this Middle Eastern city. So now it turned into a you know assassination slash car chase. Very cool. The next action sequence, this time we changed the setting where they went to an interesting place to shoot people where they actually flew on a helicopter out to insert onto a yacht in the Mediterranean and we got to write this really cool, uh, basically uh, room to room sweeping a yacht scene. And our technical advisor was uh, uh, Army Special Forces uh, Colonel and who went through and told us all the many, many things we got wrong in the sequence. But it was, so it actually that turned into an amazing sequence. Like, well, how do you like breach uh, hatches and doors on a yacht? You know, so we're having like all these explosive breaching scenes where they're fighting in this really close quarter things. And, uh, and then the final scene, we change so the bad guys come to them <laughs> to have a fight on their home turf, which all of a sudden changed the stakes. We were able to put a lot of different characters into different uh, situations and put them in danger. And so it went from being, you know, four kind of formulaic things to four more interesting things. Uh, and we ran into the, anytime, you're, anytime you look at your action sequences and they're too much the same, mix it up. Maybe you can mix up the location, you can mix up the adversaries. Um, this is a little different, like when I'm saying when I'm writing a thriller, I can throw in helicopter crashes, I can throw in car chases, I can throw in you know, drama with bombs. If I'm writing Son of the Black Sword, where it's basically dudes with swords fight other dudes with swords, it's a little bit different. And so in that time, when uh, that series, which uh, that series has done really well, and I've really enjoyed that one, um, when I'm writing epic fantasy, how I'm twisting the scenes, I will change the locations. Um, 
think of it like a video game when you have certain video game levels where the level starts to like change around the player. Same kind of thing when you're writing the book. That keeps it interesting. So I had like uh, after several fight scenes, uh, you could have duels, you could have battles, and then you start throwing in things where they're fighting in certain locations where the terrain changes around them. I had where they fought in like a construction site where they're building this big temple, and so there was like bamboo flooring all around them and the poles and that's having a fight between the poles and stuff starts to fall on them you know so you just change the environment it keeps your action sequences fresh okay and there's a million things you could do now if you're writing straight up fantasy with all sorts of magic and monsters oh my gosh then the sky is the limit don't fall into the trap of thinking that all your fight scenes need to be predictable because that's boring now if you're writing something with magic or, or superpowers that really can change the environment Oh my gosh, guys, you can go so nuts. Uh, probably one of the most famous uh, fight scenes ever written. Uh, is, this one's kind of legend. We've, <laughs> um, at the end of Hard Magic, there's a teleporting magic ninja fight on a, f on a flaming pirate dirigible. Okay? And so it's a sequence where these two people who can teleport chase each other through a flying pirate ship during a, during a typhoon. And so they just go from room to room to room to play to outside, inside, free fall, Somebody goes into the propellers, you know, and it's just this nonstop. Yeah, it was a great sequence. Um, and it's just nuts, and it winds up with a, with a teleporting blimp and a giant crash, okay? So you guys can go absolutely nuts on your action sequences. Now, that said, that action sequence also went like, I don't know, it's like 90 pages long, okay? So if you're writing a sequence like that, big crescendo kind of thing, I'm not joking, it was literally like a 90-page fight scene. How I kept that fresh was I switched between several point of view characters as it went. So as you're going through a scene, if you have the entire scene be from one character's perspective, you can do that too, if, especially if it's supposed to be like a grinding scene. Um, I recently did a book that was like a World War I trench fantasy that'll be coming out in a few months. Um, and uh, it was really good, but if I want to have a long action scene in that, it's because it's, it's World War I trench warfare in a magical world, it's different because I, I do want to get that feeling of tiredness and exhaustion and the grind, right? But I'm writing hard magic. It needs to be quick. It needs to be fast. So in that, I'm switching between point of view characters as I go. That keeps the scene fresh because all of a sudden now we're seeing the battle from an entirely different character's point of view perspective and they get a different look at it. That character, remember I talked to you guys earlier about the point of view and the vibe of that character? By each time I shift those gears and shift to a different character, I've got an entirely different vibe for that fight scene. It's almost like it's a whole new scene. Make sense? Yeah, it's just one more trick. Now, if you guys are writing first person, where the entire thing is from one person's perspective, that is harder to do, and so you gotta use other tricks for that. So like if I'm writing Monster Hunter, which is in the first person, um, and the main character is going through these events, I'm gonna have to change location because I can't change point of view. That's when all your handy things like your car crashes, your helicopter crashes, your chase scenes, the foot chase, uh, you know, the, huh, or you just cheat and have the floor collapse and they're all, all of a sudden they're in a new place, <laughs> okay? There's all sorts of stuff you guys can do on this. The sky is the limit. You are limited only by your imagination. You guys are really smart, okay? Actually, I really like this con. This is my first uh, 20 books that I've been to. I've loved this con so far because everybody here, you guys all work for a living. You know what I mean? So you're all professionals and you're all here in it to win it. And it's awesome because a lot of times you go to a writing con that's more of a trad pub con. Uh, and everybody's just sucking up to the one or two people in power. And that's really sad. <laughs> that's sad to watch. You guys can all just go be brilliant and have, not have to go through gatekeepers. So it's kind of awesome. All right. So uh, do you guys have any questions for me on writing action? I think they, I think they want you to go to the microphone, though, so they can record it. So if you guys just want to like, like, and I'll try to I'll try to speed round power through these. So make your questions brief, like to the point, and we'll just power through. You have 13 minutes. You don't have to power through right? Oh no, but I'll have a lot. Trust me, because I ramble. <laughs> when I say speed round, it's Larry's speed. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sometimes I've read really well done action scenes, but I didn't really care about the outcome. Can you talk a little bit more about making sure the stakes are clear without making yeah. the action drag? Like sure, that's really important. Okay, so have you guys ever read anything where it's like it's supposed to be something you should really care about? Like the stakes are high, the world is going to blow up, the aliens are going to kill 10 million people, and you just don't care? 
Because there's just 10 million people. It's like the old Stalin code. It's a statistic. <laughs> okay? You got to make them care. You got to make the readers care about the stakes. We didn't talk about this much because this kind of comes back to character. Character is huge. Character is one of the most vital, important things because action scenes are meaningless if the reader doesn't care what happens to any of the people. I actually see, I'll see it sometimes from less knowledge or kind of amateurish writers, they will brag about how many people they kill in their book. Or it's like, four million people die. But do I care about any of them? And that sounds callous, but that's really how the readers are going to be. You can tell all day long that this is a dangerous thing, but it doesn't matter unless the reader feels it's dangerous. So the key to that is make them love your characters. If they love your characters and then you throw those characters into danger, is this just right and good characters? Not even just love, but if they think of your characters as actual human people that they could interact with and talk to, then by golly, when you throw them in danger, their hearts are going to race. And when you kill them, they're going to cry. And they're going to yell at you. Okay? <laughs> or if you really want to mess with people, like I and Monster Hunter Alpha had one character turn into a werewolf and eat her dog. Okay, yeah. See? See? <laughs> that was cruel. And everybody loves dogs. It was a three-legged German shepherd named Otto. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. See? See? That is the power of making people care. Okay? It was tragic. It was heartbreaking. And I, I still, years later, people still talk about that scene. Okay, so that's the key. Make them care. If they care about the characters, when you hurt them, they feel it, okay? When they triumph, they feel it, okay? So that's the key, it's character. Yeah. Oh, hey, Larry, thank you for being here. Um, and you're an evil man for killing that dog, I swear. <laughs> Good thing John Wick's not here. So oh, yeah. uh, I really love, in science fiction and fantasy, I love when inanimate objects are characters, magic swords, spaceships. And one of the things that's really cool about Monster Hunter is your main character often carries the same shotgun. <laughs> How do you go about making an inanimate object like a gun a character of its own? That's actually a good one. That's a, that's a very good question. Okay, and you see this a lot. Uh, even in role-playing games, uh, some role-playing games will be like one of the skills you can take is trademark weapon. Okay? Some characters have a trademark weapon. Or in some cases, trademark ability, trademark cape, whatever it is you guys are writing. The key to this is the same thing as make the readers care. So if you have a trademark thing that matters to that character, make it matter to the character and see why it matters to the character and why the character feels the way they do about it. And because the reader is going to live vicariously through your character. So you can't just say, here is a magic sword and it's really cool. That doesn't mean anything. Okay, it's a magic sword. I've seen a thousand magic swords. But, so like Son of the Black Sword, the main character has his magic sword. I go really in-depth into this book about this guy's whole entire life with this thing and what it means to him and what it symbolizes to him and how it's changed his life. And so then when I break it, <laughs> it means a lot. It's actually like a character death, okay? So if you break a guy's sword and the reader cries, oh, man, you're gold, okay? Same thing, too. It's like, it's like Dirty Harry with his 44 Magnum, Okay? I mean, it's cool, but why is it cool? Because he's dirty hairy and it's part of his character, okay? So yeah, signature weapon, actually that, that is a very valuable thing in action. Now once again, it's gonna depend on the kind of thing you're writing, because some characters, if you're writing like the emotionalist assassin guy, as John Wick goes through 200 guns every, I mean, he's gonna kill a dude, take his gun, kill this dude, take his gun, kill this dude, you, you, know, you don't have that, okay? So it's just gonna depend on the kind of thing you're writing, but yeah, signature weapons, signature moves even, it's just about what it means to the character. So, yeah. Hello. It does work. So, um, one of the places that I draw from, from fighting scenes, because I love this stuff, uh, is UFC commentators, pro wrestling commentators. That's all they do is yeah. talk about how, you know, the course of a fight, how things affect the body. Yeah, color commentating is basically what we are doing. Right. Yeah. The problem, the problem I found with that though, because I, you know, if you talk about how, like, if if you're, you know, somebody gets their hand injured, eventually during a fight, their hand goes numb, and then you're just using it as a club or stuff like that. Where is the line that you draw from your, if you're going to your beta readers? That some beta readers, if you get technical, they'll go, um, yeah, that's that's good, too technical. But people who aren't technical go, yeah. they might think a Google plot is like a sexual move because you're putting the leg around, you know, somebody's head or whatever. Or if you go the other direction, and then the other people go, well, why don't you just say blah, 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 blah. So yeah. where do you, when do you just kind of go, okay, stop, we're just going to do okay. this? That's a good one. 
that's going to come back to it's going to come back to genre and audience um, and what you're writing for. Now, if you're writing a highly technical fight sequence thing for people that love, I mean, if they if they know who Dana White and Joe Rogan is, you know, and I don't mean from the podcast, you know, but but they they immediately they 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 that's their thing, then they're going to expect a lot higher level of technical accuracy um, than if you're writing for an audience that not so much, like, I don't know what's going on back there, but it's loud. But, um, so for me, that's going to be, it's going to be tuned based upon what the, what my readership expects. Mine expects technical proficiency and accuracy, uh, and also kind of intensity. So for those guys, I'm, if it's specific things, I'm going to get into that. And also the injuries, I'm going to get into like the injuries and, and the swelling and the pain and the numbness and the, the fact that my hand won't close anymore or one eye is swole shut, you know, because my readership wants that, you know. So I think the key to that, honestly, guys, is the biggest thing is going to be understanding your audience and, and your target audience and what you're writing for. Big thing on that, especially if you're starting out and you're new and you don't really understand necessarily what they expect, read whatever the really popular stuff is that you are in the same genre as, same category, and see kind of what level they take it to. But you don't have to imitate them. You don't have to be exactly like them. If it's not your style, it's not your style. You might be the more intense version of that. Or you might be the safer version of that. You see what I'm saying? Just depending on what you personally are comfortable with. Um, kind of like Tom Clancy's super info dumping. There's like 18 pages about how a reactor works. Yes, yeah, seriously, literally a whole chapter. And, and the thing is, though, I remember I read that. It was, and the thing is, it was super fascinating because it was well written. That was the best, not entirely accurate chapter ever about. <laughs> I mean, I learned more about that than I did in physics class in high school. You know, um, so so the question when you ask yourself is, is is who am I writing for? What am I going for? And what level do I want to take it to? Like if I'm writing. Um, like if I'm writing Monster Hunter and I have a character who's I actually I actually do have one character whose name they everybody calls him Ultimate Fighting Lawyer because he's an attorney for one of the rival companies but he was a UFC guy and he just kicks the shit out of the main character at one point and I have a lot of fun with that um, so he's Ultimate Fighting Lawyer so when his stuff is described it is very much spot on and I have to actually go do some research um, yeah so so that going to be very personal uh, yes. I have two if we have time and nobody else lines up behind me, but I'll ask my burning one Then you one go first. for it. Um, so I write pretty realistic and with injury afterwards mm -hmm. and usually on a short timeline. Can oh, you yeah. give me some guidance on how to balance keeping the stakes in individual fights high with injury being a real possibility and not completely mangling my character? That is climax? a really important one because you can actually write yourself in a corner. And I have a couple series where there's magical healing specifically so I can have better action sequences. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Um, I introduced uh, magical healing into hard magic specifically because otherwise there was no way I could keep the main character alive through three book, a three book trilogy. Um, so yeah, that is actually a very important one. If you were writing an ultra realistic gritty thing, then you gotta be real careful that you don't injure your main characters too much. I talked about this with the gun thing yesterday, but realistically, most act movie action heroes would have severe tinnitus and hearing damage. Because they're, you know, they're, they're in their bi-weekly gunfight <laughs> in a concrete stairwell, and the next scene they're whispering to somebody. Yeah. And I said, the, and I, and I said yesterday, the, the most realistic TV show ever for hearing damage for guns is Archer. Well, yeah, yeah, seriously, I, I have severe tinnitus. Um, I honestly can't hear most people, no, no offense. So if I've ever just walking past you, it's not that I'm rude. <laughs> it's because all I can hear is lawn sprinklers. <laughs> um, no, so, so honestly, so if you were writing fantasy that has some sort of magic healing or you have sci-fi where you have some sort of improved healing, you know, so if you're writing like realistic medical stuff, uh, realistic levels of medical, you got to be really careful what you do and do not do to your character. Now, sometimes... We're writing about really special, exponentially tougher than regular people, human beings. Um, and so if you want to, like, you know, injure your character you early in the book and then you want to use that throughout the book, you can actually use that as a plot point in your book. So if you want to, like, have that character sprain their ankle uh, early on in the book and then make them limp and be in miserable pain the rest of the book, popping, you know, massive amounts of Advil, go for it. Um, however, you got to be careful because you can't just like throw gunshot wounds onto people's torsos and then have them run through the rest of the book. Unless you're writing like the movie Prometheus, 
where you can literally have a C-section and remove like an 18-pound combative squid and then have Numi Rapace run through the rest of the movie with no problem. As long as she grimaces once in a while, you're fine. I was like, it moved like a, the squid the size of a bowling ball out of this 90-pound woman. No, okay, so so it's going to depend on what you're writing, but um, tread carefully with that if you don't have... Like, so if I'm writing a thriller and I'm really, really tempted for dramatic purposes to put some bullet holes into my main character in chapter one, I got to think that through, okay? And then, and then act accordingly. Also, too, one of the things, one of the disadvantages we have that movies uh, have the advantage over us uh, movies can do things like that that don't necessarily make perfect sense, but they've already moved on to the next flashy scene. Okay, The way readers' brains work is we read a thing, and then we're still processing it while we read the next line. We're still processing that while, line while we read the next line. And so it's a slower burn. So plot holes and inconsistencies in writing are more dangerous than they are in movies. Because we, our audience, has more processing time. So if you do hurt somebody, like if I say, well, in chapter one, we remove the 18-pound combative squid from her abdomen with a you know, 36-inch incision, and then the next chapter, you know, she's you know, sprinting, <laughs> the reader is going to be like, what the, you know, what the hell is this bull crap? And, and, but the movie can distract you with like, pretty visuals. A master class in that in bad writing is The Last Jedi, okay? There's horrible, stupid things occur, but it's already moved on to the next flashy visual. Okay, we can't do that. So you gotta be careful with that. Thank you, and then question number two is why I'm on lists everywhere because I did a lot of Googling. Oh um, gosh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, after researching and finding out that um, you know, concussing somebody to knock them out is a no-go and there aren't actually any drugs that are non-lethal you can inject to knock somebody out quickly. Ketamine was the best I found, but it's like a minute onset. Yeah. Um, how do you, have if you have a character that you want to subdue somebody non-lethally or less lethally, what are your go-to strategies? Okay, this is, this is a fun one because once again, this is where movies just cheat. You notice they have like sleep, the sleep darts work in fiction? Okay. Uh, yeah, because real life, no, it doesn't really work that way. And it's kind of like, because if there was an actual effective sleep dart, then like cops wouldn't need to carry guns. All right, sci-fi, you can use tasers. In real life, what's usually going to happen is you're going to overwhelm the dude with several people, throw a bag over his head and toss him in the back of the van and drive off real fast is what usually happens in real life. Um, honestly, though, there's not a good way. Human, and this is, goes back to the stuff I used to teach professionally. The human body is an amazing thing that can adjust on the fly to trauma like really quickly. Oh, we're out of time. Um, so what I would do is just honestly, you're either beating the crap out of them or giving them a TBI and just whacking them over the head with something, which may or may not kill them. Or you're drugging them and you're watching, you know, you're putting something in their drink and then you're watching them for 15 minutes until they get woozy on the dance floor, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, it's creativity on that one. Choke them out, choke them in unconsciousness. Everybody fades without sufficient oxygen. Okay, we are out of time, guys. All right, I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah um, if, if this was helpful, check out Writer Dojo. Uh, new episode every Wednesday, just Writer Dojo. It's one word. It's on all the podcast places.